before I get into the official introductions, um, I'll do one little bit of organization for y'all. So because Avid Bookshop is a little, uh, little independent bookstore here in Athens, Georgia, uh, we have a smaller online budget uh, event budget than a lot of people do. And so instead of paying through the nose through the, for the Zoom webinar, we um, set up regular Zoom meetings and we mimic the webinar style by having every attendee other than the featured attendees um, hide their screens and mute themselves. And then if you want to make it so that your screen is full just of the people who are speaking tonight, all you have to do is hover over any one of the names of the people who um, don't have their video on and then click the three dots in the upper right hand corner of that person's screen and then click hide non-video participants. And once you do that, you'll see that it's just me and the four guests tonight. So I will now officially kick off this event. Uh, my name is Janet Geddes. I am the business owner and the founder. I would say here at Avid Bookshop, I'm actually a couple miles from my store. Uh, we have been closed since March 16th, 2020 uh, due to the pandemic, but because of support from authors and presses and publishing partners like you all and customers, we have been able to not only stay open, but retain employment for our staff and meet payroll every pay period. So we really thank you guys. Um, even little purchases made, made with us right now are truly keeping us alive and keeping our bills paid. So thank you for being here. Uh, as soon as we learned about this book from Hub City Press, uh, we were thrilled to entertain the possibility of hosting an event. Um, Rachel Watkins, who's our communications director, events director, operations director, she's, she does so much at Avid Bookshop. She fell in love with this book, got in touch with Hub City Press, which is a really cool independent press in nearby Spartanburg, South Carolina. And we had worked with Sunel Barnes, the editor of this book before in order to do an event. And so we were really thrilled that we could pull this off, even though we can't do it in person the way we really like to. So before I introduce the person who's going to be the official host of tonight's discussion, um, because we will be dealing with really beautiful words and sensitive conversation and interesting topics, we thought that we would start just by inviting all of you who are willing and feel safe to do so to close your eyes. And just for about a minute, we're gonna do some breathing that is, that's a short exercise that the purpose of it is to get us feeling concentrated, energized and focused so we can really be here for the event. So if you do feel comfortable doing so, please close your eyes now. And we're gonna be breathing in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, out for four seconds, and then we'll start again. So it's four, 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 four. So in a minute, here we begin. I want you to breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Breathe in, hold it, let it out, hold it, and one more cycle of this. Breathe in, two, three, four, hold it, two, three, four, let it out, two, three, four, hold it, two, three, four. Now you can breathe normally again. Welcome officially to our event. Um, for a measure of belonging. I would like to now introduce uh, Josina Guest, who is going to be moderating tonight's conversation with the authors. Josina Guest is a writer and the managing editor of The Bitter Southerner, an online magazine that tells stories about the South and all its complexity. She was born in Alabama, grew up in Washington, DC, and spent time in the Midwest and Philadelphia before settling outside of Athens, Georgia with her family, goats, dogs, chickens, and cats. Welcome, Josina. We're so honored that you're here for us tonight and take it away. Thank you, Janet. And thank you so much, Avid Bookshop. You're my local bookshop and I, um, I can't wait to, to be in Athens and be at a, a gathering that is in person with food. And I'm just uh, 
happy to greet all of the participants that are there. Glad that you showed up. Um, and happy for Sunel and Tana and Aruni to be here. Just excited to um, enter into this conversation. So um, I think because I am kind of missing human gatherings and, and imagining that we're sitting together, I've got a cup of tea here. I thought I would just first, before doing formal introductions, just ask Sunel, Tiana, and Aruni to share what they've brought to our imaginary um, book opening potluck. And if, if participants also want to type in where you're coming in from and, and what you've brought to the imaginary dessert potluck, let us know, no pressure. Um, also be thinking about questions you may have if you've, um, if you've read the book or if you just have questions for the authors, um, we will have time for that. And we really want this to be an interactive um, conversation as much as we're able. So, um, Sunil, what did you bring? I have um, my go-to truffles from Trader Joe's. Um, I was going to bring a donut, and then I realized I just had Thai foods. So it might be a little too much. Um, I also have rosé. Um, nice. It's like my bedtime drink. Tiana, what did you bring to our imaginary public? I would have brought probably a sweet potato pie, which is far yes. superior than the pumpkin pie. You can fight me in the chat about it. Do you bake your own? Well, it's interesting. I made my first one last year, which was a disaster. Um, but I'm going to try it again this year. It almost defeated me, but this year I'm going to try it again. Um, but uh, I know there's a big debate between sweet potato and pumpkin pie, but sweet potato pie is far superior. Oh, yeah. All the way. <laughs> from, what have you got, Arini? Yeah, from the uh, local Asian shop, I got, uh, I got banana chips. Um, I just actually finished them before the, <laughs> this conversation. <laughs> I had a whole plate of them and these are, they are lovely. And mm -hmm. I would like you, anybody who's in Athens to go to the, to the Fuchs food and get the banana chips there. They're lovely. Are they, are they sweet or savory? They're savory. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. savory. Um, mm -hmm. And um, they're, I think, cooked in coconut oil. Nice. So very, it has a very nice taste to it. Yeah, yeah that's a great shop. Cool. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, now I'm going to do um, formal introductions and, um, and then we'll get started with our conversation. So Sunel Barnes is a memoirist, essayist, and educator from Manila, Philippines. She's the author of Monsoon Mansion, a memoir, and Malaya Essays on Freedom. She's also the editor of this collection. And she's living in Charleston, South Carolina, um, working with a focused fellowship for literary journalism. Welcome, Sunel. So glad to to have you here. I wanted to just start by asking you how the concept of this book um, came about. Like, how did you decide to, to edit it or form the collection? Yeah, um, I talk a little bit about it in the introduction to the book in which you know, I, I say a little bit about this interaction from nearly 10 years ago with um, someone at a welcome dinner who told me that nobody asked me to come here. Um, and that was uh, one of my first you know, experiences here. And I just thought I could let this scare me away and make it you know, a reason for me to turn back around. Or I can make a definitive choice to do the opposite of what's just been said to me and done to me. And um, you know, there's so many ways to write about that. And, so many ways to um, you know diversify your reading list and all things like that but something that I knew I had access to and something that I knew I could do with um, the resources I have and with the skills I have was to um, make a party out of a book basically and invite some of my you know most beloved and favorite um, writers of color writing about the south or in the south or to the south um, so these people are really people who have been stalking <laughs> for X number of years. Um, yeah, and it's, it's really just been a book that I've wanted to read in the past 10 years, but also um, a book that I would have wanted to read, you know, way before that, maybe either as a child or as a teenager or as a college student or an early adult. You know, it's, it's something that I would have spent my savings on or, you know, my waiting table money on or um, my cleaning lady money on, you know. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's, it's been a decade in the making, really. 
And towards the end of your intro, you say each one of these essays then is an invitation to step into power and to empower. Um, an RSVP to Honey, I invite you to be here and tell me your story. And I, I love that you took a, a moment of unwelcome and, and turned it on its head and turned it into a moment of welcome and a moment of creation and uh, invitation. And so um, on that, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Tiana and ask you to speak a little bit. Um, Tiana Clark is the author of the poetry collection, I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood, winner of the 2017 Agnes Lynch Starrett Prize and Equilibrium, selected by Afa Michael Weaver for the 2016 Frost Place Chapbook Competition. She teaches creative writing at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, and she is on location in Nashville as a teacher. <laughs> so she's in Tennessee teaching in Illinois. So welcome, Tiana. Um, your story, um, I feel like I just want to jump right into it. it it's, it's interesting, each of your, I mean, there's 21 writers in the, in the collection and each one really responded so differently. I, I noticed that some, some people just sort of jumped right in with um, their own families and their own safe spaces that are created. And in each of um, the essays that I read by you, it's sort of about these these moments of interaction with strangers that made that felt more estranging. <laughs> Everything from like, uh, you know, really direct rudeness and racism to, to probing and uh, what we sometimes call microaggressions, which feel like real aggressions. But um, Tian, I think yours is the most um, aggressive story in terms of the experiences uh, that you describe. And I don't know if you would like to. Um, Wondering if you'd want to read from it or just talk about your your um, your epistle to the South and writing about your feelings towards Tennessee. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I would definitely call them probably macro aggressions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can talk about this one. I wasn't going to read this paragraph, but I'll, I'll read it because I think uh, mm -hmm. it's her mom's birthday today. So I'll read this kind of in honor of her. <clears throat> can everyone hear me? All right. Mm -hmm. I wanted to escape the South and the two nooses left on our back porch, one for my mom and one for me. My mom didn't tell me about the nooses till I was much older. She didn't want to terrify me as a child. Years later, she said they were hung up in sloppy knots after the first night we moved into our one bedroom apartment in Brentwood, Tennessee, a welcome gift from our new white neighbors. Sometimes I still imagine her there on our small back porch alone, a single black mother, looking at these crude death symbols swaying imagining my little neck and then hers breaking, thinking everything she had ever thought about the South coming true before her like two pendulous omens exploding. She called her friends who took them down and prayed for our protection. My mother never touched the ropes. Thank you. And uh, before we started this call, we were talking about how it's, um, it's really tempting to talk about racism in the past tense and to talk about our memories of racism, but the acknowledgement of being a person of color, of color in the South or in the United States or in a world with white supremacy, um, there are these ongoing forces. Um, so, yeah. yeah. What's interesting about that experience is my mom yeah. didn't tell me that until I was much older and it was so shocking for me to think about her carrying that alone and like what do you tell your children about mm -hmm. these kind of uh incidents of violence and how do you absorb them and it was so shocking to me when she finally told me when i was much older but um thinking about that when just being here for one week we had moved from california and so to imagine having two nooses on your back porch i can't imagine what that would be like for like a single black mother you know um mm -hmm. it's terrifying to think about yeah did you ask her like what it was like to bear that? I mean, or, or even just, I was thinking about just the way that she didn't, chose not to tell you. And I'm yeah. imagining that as an act of love. I mean, I'll turn this into a moment of levity. If anyone has a black mother out there or knows a black mother or auntie, or I, mean, I think all aunties or grandmothers, I mean, my mom just has carried a lot of violence and has hit it really well. So it's really actually hard to dialogue with her about these incidents. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably why I'm a writer, is that I'm wanting to probe and investigate and 
unpluck and 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 tease out all these implications i think she's probably wanting to suppress and just keep moving forward she very much couldn't stop to probably think about this impact because she had to go to her second and third job and so it's very interesting for me when i do talk to her it's very matter of fact and a lot of black women in my family are like that um and they've experienced so much hardship and uh micro and macro aggressions and all types of their jobs but i think um the women in my family carry that hardness as a countenance on them and so i think for me and what i try to do in my writing is to kind of give them that softness that they don't get to experience in, in the world um and hope through my writing that i can with with an act of empathy um like hold them in that space um is my hope okay. and I have that dialogue with them that I, i'm not able to really with my mom so mm -hmm. okay. and happy birthday to your mom yeah. <laughs> yeah. thank you um, and uh, I see folks chiming in with the affirmation of what you just said, so it's nice to hear that. Um, and uh, we'll have more room for looping back for more questions and conversation. Aruni, I realize I did not clarify the pronunciation of your last name, so I'd like you to do that before I mess up. I want to make sure I say it right. Well, you said the first name very correctly, Aruni Kashyap. Kashyap, okay. Aruni Kashyap is a writer and translator. He's the author of His Father's Disease and the novel, The House with a Thousand Stories. He is an assistant professor of creating, creative writing at the University of Georgia in Athens. And he also writes in Assamese and is a translator in Assamese. And his first Assamese novel is, what's your first Assamese novel? Raikon Etia Durot. Raikon Etia Durot, awesome. So, um, Aruni, you are in Athens and you wrote about um, looking for an apartment in Athens and, and someone asking you a question and the question was, are you a Muslim? So I was wondering, you know, I mean, are you a Muslim? That's how they asked it. And um, I was wondering if you could read from page 100. I, I don't know if the paging is the same. I just the so. paragraph um, where it just starts with you repeating that question in your head, are you a Muslim? Okay, sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's yeah. a very um, important paragraph, Josina. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to position my book somewhere. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> are you a Muslim? I look, I look around for a chair to sit, but we are outside the house now in the front yard. I'm about to leave. It is almost noon and there is a lot more to do such as view another house, buy groceries, and search websites for apartments. But I feel like taking a nap. I just want to go home and lie in my bed and stare at the white ceiling. I say, excuse me? I think about the several places I have viewed. Good areas where good white people live with other non-white people from around the world, people who would probably vote for Stacey Abrams. I think about the apartment on Deering Street that I found on Facebook. After viewing the apartment rented by a young lady, we talked about a huge sectional she had brought, bought from a st store called Anthropology. She said she had only received two queries, including one from me. She was in a hurry to get out of her lease. The other query was from a young freshman who couldn't move in until August. I said, then it is a great fit for me. I said that I would confirm after an hour once I viewed the apartment on Prince Avenue, another cool part of the town. When I texted her later that day, I thought about the adequate natural light the house received where I would place my writing desk. I was sure my house hunting was over. To my surprise, I received a text. Sorry, the other girl applied and got approved. Um, I hope that's, so, yeah. that's all right. Yeah, th yeah, that's great. I just think um, the way that uh, there was this question asked of you and it just brought this feeling of exhaustion, you know? And, um, and it made me think about like when you meet someone new, you know, they can ask you questions that can open you up, you know? Or instead they can ask you questions that can shut you down. And I was just thinking about that, like that line between curiosity and immediately othering a person. And if you just wanted to talk a little bit about what that's, that's yeah, I mean, I feel like you described it, but. Yeah, that's a great question, Jocelyn. You know, actually, when um, I, I was actually looking for houses, this was the second time, the first time I got a lot of help from 
a new friend here. And so it was absolutely no problem. Uh, but the second time I was doing it all on my own. And then I was surprised by the um, sometimes invasive, sometimes curious questions that actually reminded me of a lot of experience in New Delhi, where I went to study uh, university. And uh, I'm from a region called Northeast India, where uh, the people come from, from a different race. Uh, and, and most people who are migrants in the rest of the country from the Northeast India uh, face about 86% um, of the migrants from Northeast face racism according to state statistics. And it's very difficult for a Northeastern migrant in, in main cities in India to get a house. So uh, it has been a nightmarish experience in Delhi to, for me to actually find a rented apartment. So the questions reminded me of that experience. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, because um, the, some of the most of the questions were, as you say, microaggressions. You know, we talked about, and I'm the kind of person who sometimes miss that. Uh, for me, uh, I, I have an instinctual response to it. I know that this question is probably not right, but when I told one of my friend in Minnesota, she was so angry. She said, "You, you, 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 you must post about this on social media. You must uh, call them out." I, and I and I very politely refused. Uh, this this left the space, so. Um, I think people, you know, people have so many blind spots. This, I think this experience exposed me to the blind spots of people uh, who think they are liberals. And we all have blind spots. And I think we need to, we need to introspect a lot more on that because it others people. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, for me, that's why I think the experience, when I look back at it, I look at it both with a wry sense of um, humor and distance, but at the same time, there is some surprise and hurt as well. It's a mixture of all of that, and and we had another conversation about this experience. And I wanted to uh, I wanted to stress that you know uh, one of the reasons I wrote this essay because I actually love living here. Uh, I, you know, this is coming from a, a, a space of um, a lot of love, and and uh, instead of instead of predominantly disappointment, uh, it's delight more than disappointment. And because I love Athens, because I nobody I don't want any other immigrant person to actually to be asked this question, I wrote this essay. And, and I think you, you critique and, and look at those spaces critically that you absolutely love. I mm -hmm. moved here in 2018, all the way from India. I had no idea what Georgia is all about, except what I watched in the movies and read in the novels, you know? I read mm -hmm. all the novels by Tyree Jones. Uh, so, and uh, uh, and I, was, uh, I was very um, curious to find out what I would learn and how, what I would experience. And, um, and, and it has been a wonderful, uh, you know, incredible experience since then. Uh, and, and, and that is why I thought I must write this essay where nobody else has to face such a question. And yeah, that, that, those are the thoughts that, that are coming to my mind as, I, as I'm trying to address your question. Yeah, that's great. I'm curious, Sanel, what, what do you love about living in the South? Oh, um, Oh, sorry, I was, I was pointing it to Sanel, but we can loop around. If everyone wants to say something, just everyone gets a chance to share. Well, now, you know what I love about living in the South? I, I actually lived in, in Minnesota uh, for three years uh, long ago. And, uh, and I think um, the, the social life is so much more uh, um, uh, warmer, uh, more people intermingle a lot, people meet each other a lot. It mm -hmm. reminds me of like, you know, small town India in some ways where people are um, really chatty, they are warmer, people also visit each other's houses, which, is, which was not very, no, not very common in the Midwest uh, small town I lived in. Mm -hmm. I mean, people did, but it was, it was only on, on special occasions. But here mm -hmm. I have friends and colleagues where we, where we sort of, um, you know, remain in touch, we talk to each other and, and in normal days, you know, unlike 2020, you know, we visit each other or we hang out for, for a mm -hmm. meal. That is something I find is very much like India, actually, to be very honest. And that's what I like about the social life, the warmth, the people, you know, have for each other. That is something I find is very special about the South. Mm -hmm. So now, what about you? What, what do you love about the South? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have only lived in Charleston and Athens, Georgia, actually. Um, what I loved about Athens, Georgia was it was a college town. Um, I remember just being really energized by um, this weird mix of what they call townies and then college culture, college life. Um, I became of age in New York City, so I, I'd never had any 
engagement with university life or um, or small town art. Um, that was yeah. You know, that that to me was a breath of fresh air. Um, sometimes stifling, but for the most part, I think still a breath of fresh air. I still regret not charging people for parking in our yard during game day. Like I should have done that, like thirty dollars an hour. Um, but I remember, I remember that was just like, why have you parked outside our house? I was like, oh, they're coming to gather, like watch a game together. Um, and then trash our yard afterwards. <laughs> but, um, and then in Charleston, what I really love is, you know, it's coastal. I'm a coastal girl. I grew up in the Philippines. Um, I consider it a gift to be surrounded by plants and animals that are familiar to me, that's comforting to me. Um, salt air is comforting to me. I feel like it just recalibrates my brain and I need it to. Um, also, you know, my closest experience with you know, Southern culture or Southern life is my husband's family. And even though I write extensively about um, how difficult it can be, I, I try to also talk about how, um, how much I really do love them. And there's a sense of permanence in their family that I don't have being, you know, a transnational adoptee who became undocumented, who then was transplanted again, who really like I don't have heirloom of any kind. Like, and I think that's why I write. Like that's mm -hmm. that's what I can pass on to my daughter and um, the generations after her, because that's all I have are stories and words. Mm -hmm. um, but with them, with my husband's family, I mean, they have belongings from the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I'm sitting next to furniture that is almost as old as this country. Mm -hmm. um, but even though they are symbols of a certain kind of permanence, a certain kind of history, to live in it kind of stokes the fire in me and makes me again, like Arunin said, you know, lovingly criti critique or criticize what mm -hmm. is right before my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, th I think it's that. And then when, you know, when Janet was reading your bio about, and how you're surrounded by all these animals, that's something that I'm working toward. <laughs> um, little by little, just adding to my collection of some things I can grow and feed in our yard. That, especially during the pandemic, that's really handy. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of joy. Also, Josina, it doesn't snow a lot. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. That's very, very important. I, I like that. Yeah, we had like three feet of snow the winters before we left Philadelphia, like multiple three feet of snow. And I was just like, I'm done. <laughs> so, Tiana, what are some of the things you love about the South? Um, I love the South kind of for an odd reason in that. Um, I wrote this in my essay. I said there is no promised land anywhere. And I think a lot of, I think, um, I didn't realize how much I loved the South until I left it. Mm -hmm. And when I had a fellowship at UW-Madison in Wisconsin. And I think I had this idea of this kind of romantic, elitist, Northern imagination, um, as if racism would be easier in the Midwest. And it, it wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. It was different. It had a different, I mean, racism is everywhere, but it has a different flavor and texture everywhere. And I think what was weirder for me in the Midwest is that, um, you know, it's a quote from Zora Neale Hurston, um, you know, I, I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. And so I think there was this dissonance that I felt in the Midwest, uh, even though I was in this kind of pseudo liberal college town in Madison that had the sheen of liberalism and all the all the signs everywhere and Black Lives Matter signs, I didn't see black people. There was no black middle class there. And so I right. felt extremely isolated and I felt extremely alone. And that's what I miss about the South. I miss seeing black, being around black people, doing the nod, doing the exchange. I mean, today I was in the park and I, I live in a part of town in Nashville, it's very white. And there's this elderly black couple at the park and they just gave me this very endearing look and wave with their masks on. And I, I have my mask up, like, I knew it was the kind of thing of like, hey, if something goes on in this park, I got you, you know? Um, mm -hmm. 
And there's a way that I know how to carry myself in the South that I don't know how to carry myself in other parts of the country. And that for here, racism is very stark. Like there's no wolves walking around in sheep's clothing. If, you're, if your car is all decked out in Confederate garbs and you know, certain kind of regalia, I know how to carry myself. Right, like I know where to I know where to go and and not go. The boundaries are very clear, but in the Midwest, um, all that was kind of occluded, right? Or I would often be in these spaces where I'd be the only black person, but I would get stared at a lot. And the gaze was different up there. It wasn't a stare like a hateful stare, but it was almost this gaze of what are, What are you doing here? Or I don't often see people like you at this bougie grocery store. Or mm -hmm. um, it was more psychological. And so I think what I love about the South is I can breathe. My breath is easier here mm -hmm. um, because I know how to carry myself. Um, I see black people. I know where to get good food. I talk about that in my essay. I know how to get sweet tea. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm close to my mom and there's, you know, the data is showing that a lot of black millennials are actually moving back home because of this reason, um, that they're feeling really isolated and alone um, in the Northeast and the mm -hmm. Midwest. And so they see this reverse migration happening actually right now. One, because it's cheaper, and two, because I think people are wanting to be back home, back with family, um, back with that sense of comfort. Um, I also want to say to the, your other question about othering, I wanted to add, I often get asked in the South, like, what am I? A lot. Um, I'm mixed. My mom is Black and my dad is white. And to Aruni's point, I think a lot of those questions are questions that are trying to trace and place you and put you in a kind of social hierarchy of like, how am I supposed to relate to you? And if I can't tell them how I'm supposed to relate to you, like, I need to know what the social codes are, right? Um, and so oftentimes I buck against those kind of questions, that type of othering. But I think a lot of those times it's people trying to do that tracing and placing in a way um, mm -hmm. that it can be really, really disconcerting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, may I just, uh, you know, jump in? Uh, yeah. Diana, absolutely. You know, I mean, the othering question also comes from the shock that I have seen in people's eyes that I'm an English professor. And mm -hmm. I've mentioned in the essay where several, several people who are showing me houses, realtors or landlords, they wanted to clarify, like the, they, they couldn't take the fact that I, I can teach American literature, that, that, that I teach literature, that I teach creative writing. So they would repeatedly ask me, do you teach ESL? Do you teach them in the English language? And I, when I said, no, I teach them uh, creative writing uh, uh, and I teach them literature um, because it is seen, I mean, which is these, these hierarchies don't exist for me, that somebody who teaches ESL is doing something lesser than somebody who teaches literature. But these hierarchies exist in the minds of the people who questioned me, where they thought that teaching the language to non-native speakers is, is, a, is, a, is something that is a you know, lesser degree of uh, intellectual achievement and exercise than teaching American literature to to American students. That's why they do teach American students, you know, uh, uh, and that, that's, that's the question I, I, I face many times. So that's the othering, because I think a lot of them couldn't figure out, like, what's an Indian doing here teaching in an English department in America? Uh, if only somebody knew the history of post-colonialism and seen how many Indian professors that they're in the English departments everywhere in the world. <laughs> I know, <right? laughs> that you talked about, you know, people asking you if you taught ESL because I had to take the ESL test um, to get my degree. And I'm like, you know, I'm a copy editor, right? <laughs> like, like, I know AP style and MLA and like all the style books, right? Like, no, but you still have to take it. And I'm like, I am talking to you right now. Um, but I think it, it's those kinds of questions. And it's for me as a mom now, you know, it's interesting, not interesting, it's painful to, and it's such a waste of time and energy to even hear people ask my child like questions like that, you know, and um, I had an essay from last year about, you know, a little girl walking up to my daughter and touching her arm and asking why is your skin brown? And you know, my daughter intuitively looked at me, kind of grinned, and then looked back at her playmate and said, well, because my mom is brown. And I thought, clever girl, but I hate mm -hmm. that you have to be clever. I hate that, you know, in, in first grade, you have to be clever, that you've learned how to be clever, and you're going to have to be clever so many times in your life. Mm -hmm. and you're so exhausted. You're going to be 18 and exhausted. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of like speaks to Arunis' experience from earlier. And 
another time I remember really just getting so angry when someone, you know, a mom who was picking up her child from a play date saying, I just love being friends with you. And I'm like, okay, cool. And he was like, and she was like, you know, you guys just make our life interesting. And I was just like, what? I, I remember telling her, we are not your accessories and we're not playing anymore. Like, no, we are not here to make you interesting. We're here to not be interested. Like, we're, we're just supposed to be here. You know, um, and that's when I realized, oh my gosh, like I have to work really hard to place my child who's half white in places where she's not always the only brown kid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that for us, that's sometimes a 40 minute drive to the naval base so that she can go to Filipino dance class or go to a Filipino restaurant or you know, eat Filipino ice cream amid other Filipino kids. Or, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's manipulating your life to, mm -hmm. to be in certain geographies where you're not interesting or making someone interesting. Um, so you yeah, I, I wish, I feel like, oh man, we could keep going. <laughs> like, this is, could be a long conversation, but there's a question in here from um, Derek, who's, I, I think, I, I, it's funny, the name was there and then I, I moved the thing, I want to make sure I'm getting it right. Yep, Derek Jefferson wrote, um, I'm African American, my family's from the South. Historically, so much of the South's narrative is rooted in the tension and power dynamics between Black and white people. I'm wondering if the panelists could talk a bit about what this feels like now in 2020. How does this particular history legacy record inform your contemporary lives? Um, so. um, may I? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah I think um, um, we we often forget in the history or uh, in the conversation about uh, racism also there are people uh, what Laila Lalami um, uh, this book called uh, calls conditional citizens uh, there are citizens who are naturalized um, but they have to behave in a certain way to be treated equally um, Muslims primarily that immigrant experience is not often seen I think uh, generally in literature uh, we also have to figure out that there are also people called resident aliens, people like me, who are on a visa uh, here. Um, and uh, even those citizens um, have to adhere to, uh, even those people, immigrants, who are not citizens here, have to adhere to certain rules and regulations, certain expectations, in order to be seen as um, uh, acceptable. As you know, that tension between people who are um, who are immigrants but not permanent residents who are permanent residents, but not citizens, who are naturalized citizens, but are conditional citizens. I think that tension uh, is, is represented in literature, but in very, very uh, few um, texts. I think um, in 2020, that is one thing I think American citizens, I think must think a lot about uh, and, and, and try to honor those experiences and, um, and help people who are, uh, who are in those precarious, uh, uh, situations. There's a book that has come out recently, actually, it's called Conditional Citizens by the American author Lela Lalami, who is a naturalized citizen. And, and the first essay talks about it. It's a very beautiful essay. Uh, what does it mean to be a conditional citizen? Do you have mm -hmm. equal rights? Uh, and, and how the experience of citizenship differs from those, um, you know, who are conditional citizens and those who are white citizens, those who are African Americans, and so on. And those who are the citizens by birth, how it is different than experience. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think yeah. Go ahead, Tiana. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking about like sort of the particular legacy of like race-based slavery mm -hmm. against African people, and like the ways in which even like in Southern history, you know, like I think about like the Siamese twins who were famous in the circus, Cheng and Ang. Um, by becoming powerful, wealthy citizens in North Carolina, they enslaved other people because that's what it meant to to assimilate and be. Mm -hmm fully accepted in, uh, in society as, uh, you know, as Asian immigrants. So I'm just, yeah, so I was curious, Tiana, it looked like you're about to say something too, but I'm just wondering about like those intersections of like, 
what, um, yeah, particularly white and black <laughs> identity and, and uh, power in the South, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, Derek, thank you for your question. And um, it kind of circles back to your point, um, Justina, about, um, you know, so many people wanna talk about uh, racism in the past as if, as if it's on this current thing. And, you know, right before our Zoom call, actually we were kind of testing our mics. I live next to, uh, uh, my neighbor is super racist. Uh, he's an older white man and um, he has like racist tirades um, all the time in his front lawn, um, yells out the N-word, yells out really horrible, nasty, violent, um, things all the time and so I was trying to warn everyone in the group like hey if you see me switch rooms or go downstairs this is why and that, I mean I live next to that violence um every day um and it's something that's really hard to to reckon with because it's so interesting the different responses from my friends like a lot of my white girlfriends are like you just need to tell him off and you need to tell him who you are and I'm like that's really easy for you to say I was like um like for me um, I don't want to have any act of retribution. You know, I feel a sense of kind of, uh, you know, it's that flight or fight. And for me, it's the, you know, one thing I think a lot of people talk about with slavery, if not about slavery, is that like, the reason I'm here is because probably people in my slave line stayed, right? They didn't, like, resistance can look like staying on the plantation. Um, mm -hmm. Resistance, like fighting looks different, right? And so um, there's a certain type of survival that has to happen. Um, and so it's just this really interesting thing that I'm enacting in my life right now in this very contemporary setting. Um, I hope that the answer is I got up because I tried to look for a book and then I okay. ran It's way too high up for me. Yeah. Um, but it's called Brown Skin, White Minds. And it speaks directly about Filipino culture, but I think it's applicable to um, other immigrant cultures and that yeah you know, as Filipinos it's it's ingrained in us to be like to be chameleon like um, to really for survival wear the mask or the cloak or the skin of the oppressor and you know we um, we have you know what, a 40,000 year history and only within maybe the last 700 years have we been forced to shed our culture and even assimilate into one another to survive. So like, you know, a nation of 7,000 islands isn't really a static identity, but we've had to have a static identity and that static identity out of survival has become white face, white cloak, white skin and white thoughts and white, as, you know, white aspirations. And I know that for the Filipino people that I dearly love and respect, it is an everyday conscious choice to not do that, to not wear that, to not proclaim that, to not assist in, you know, um, propping that up and and I think this speaks to most Asian cultures you know we are a part of racial triangulation where we're either stepping on our black and brown brothers and sisters to move up or we are holding doors open or moving away standing out of the way and owning up to our mistakes which we all do, you know, um, I think, I think there's, there's that chameleon identity that is necessary to unlearn and necessary to like always have top of mind so that you're making decisions that are truly about welcoming and building some sense or measure of belonging, you know, and if you look at the table of contents of the book, I tried my best to reflect the demographics of the South in the selection of writers and the selection of states. And um, yeah, there's, we, we play a role in, in oppression, in the oppression of Black people 
I think. Um, and yeah, so I think that even though historically the tensions have been between black and white, I think definitely other people of color, you know, it's one side or the other. Cool. Um, just to give a quick heads up, we've got like 10 minutes for this whole thing closes out and I'm like, oh, we're just, I just love this conversation. Um, and I also want to acknowledge like um, someone mentioned Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, which a lot of this is touching on. And um, Aruni, I would love if we have time to ask you a little bit about like caste and racism and the ways you, can, you kind of you talked about exercising Hindu privilege, which is not something we hear often in like the Bible Belt. Um, but I do want to first bring in this question from um, uh, Sarah Kersey, who's in New Jersey. She said, this collection really resonates with me because I'm also a person who dislikes her home and spent a lot of time longing for a different place. It's outside Chicago where most people are black and where my mom grew up. I'd like to know if the panelists can talk about how to thrive where you're planted, especially when you feel stuck where you live. Mm -hmm. I think um, what Sarah is getting to, I mean, I think there's that like kind of diasporic longing that I think mm -hmm. that a lot of displaced people always feel. It's that ache for that home always, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the Avid Bookshop has this book. I mean, it's a very, it's a very self healthy book, but I, mean, I, I love me some Brene Brown, which has a great book called Breaking the Wilderness. <laughs> And the whole concept of the book is like, until you are rooted in yourself, until you belong to yourself, you belong nowhere. Um, and it was Dr. Maya Angelou who told her that. And so I really carry that sense with me that, um, and that was kind of the whole point of my essay is that I, that I, I said, um, you know, I carry that sense of home with me wherever I go. I, you can carry Southside Chicago with you wherever you go. Um, you know, when I saw the, that elderly black couple with me and they gave me that nod, like I, I carry that with me wherever I travel. You know, like you can always find your people you know, and especially I think when you're a person of color, you are, you always know when you can find those little lighthouses everywhere. Um, and so that was my takeaway from my essay. The question I was trying to, to answer is that, um, I think James Baldwin said, home is an irre irre I can't this word, irrevocable place. And so mm -hmm. that sense of home, I get to create and carry with me because I don't have one here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just say, be rooted where you are, find that sense of home within yourself. Um, and like always, you go to literature to feel less alone in the world. So I think that this book becomes another type of home. Um, and I also wanted to add to Sunil's point, when you were talking about masks, it made me think about the Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem, like we wear the, we wear the mask that grins and lies, which you wrote, you know, during the Harlem Renaissance. But I feel like, you know, we're all kind of talking about the different masks that we have to wear uh, in society, the different masks of survival that, to thrive, um, these different questions. And so, um, that's something I'm actively thinking about right now in a really kind of political tipping point moment that we're in, so. Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think what, you know, Aruni and Tiana have done is instead of opting for apathy, they made something. Um, and I, I want to say that I can recall this quote. <laughs> Clearly, but I can't, um, but it's something like fully human, we will be making things. Mm -hmm. you know, and to thrive is to be fully human. And whatever, whatever identities and multitudes live within you, to be all those things, you will be making things. Whether making for you is writing or painting or sculpture or pottery or opening a bookshop or making food or um, writing a letter um, yeah, we will be making things. And so I can encourage you to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have lived, lived a life in different places. By the way, I think I misunderstood the earlier question, but anyway, sorry about that. If I just put a big chunk of text and I realized that, you know, it, uh, it was asking something else. Uh, but uh, coming back to this question by Sarah, I think, you know, I have lived uh, away from home since I was 18 uh, in different parts of India uh, and different parts. Here also, I came to Minnesota after I finished college in the US, uh, in, in India. Then I moved back to India and lived in another part of India. Then I came back here. The only only thing that has helped me is by creating community of like-minded people. 
and that could be anything. It, it could be people from the same community, uh, ethnically or linguistically, um, or it could be people who care about books. That's also a community. I have created that. Um, and of course, you know, um, things from home like books and, and cooking your own food. All mm -hmm. of these actually has helped me survive. Uh, so that would be my, my suggestion to Sarah. Does it help you thrive? <laughs> like I, the difference between surviving and thriving, it's helping you thrive? Uh, at first you try to survive and I think yeah. you try. Yeah. You, you do miss home a lot when you leave your space and mm -hmm. then you uh, survive for a few, for, for the first few months or a year and then you try after that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I also want to add, you know, Tony Morrison has a quote that often gets quoted, like, you know, if there's a book you want to read that hasn't been written, you got to write it. But I believe the same thing is true about community. If there's a community that you want to be in, that mm -hmm. you want to thrive in, you got to create it. And I, I think, especially for POCs, that sense of having to create your own space to survive is a major theme. And so, um, yes, we're living in extreme pandemic times, but there's ways to connect with people on Zoom, um, you know, starting a, a way to reach out and connect with each other. And so, like, that's something that I, I really advocate for as well. I also advocate for rest, by the way. <laughs> that's not something I was taught as an immigrant child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, oh. hi, everyone. I'm back from that sort of magical reverie. I wish that we could have stayed in this space much longer than we have. Um, I am grateful to all of you, though, and I'm really grateful that we have this book so that we can dip back into the writing featured uh, by all these writers of color, including the people who are on today's call. I did want to do a couple things. One, I wanted to make it very clear that we are so grateful, not just that the Bitter Southerner partnered with us on this event for promotion and hosting. Thank you, Josina. But My also, pleasure. Um, she, you did a great job. Uh, but the Bitter Southerner has been such an amazing resource and source of inspiration. Um, just, it's a really amazing uh, website, newsletter, store. They have all sorts of things going on, a lot of their own events and programming. They always work with independent bookstores if there's something book related. So for anybody who is quite sure what it is, please go visit their website. Um, I also encourage you to save the chat um, if you know how to do that because we have a lot of links to really good books in addition to the link to this book. Um, and also for those of you who are really, for you, if you've already read this book or if you're gonna get this book and another one, um, we do a service called Avid Matchbook. So it's just avidbookshop.com slash matchbook or Avid Matchbook. Uh, but essentially you can let us know what sorts of books you're looking for. So if you're looking to read more writers of color, if you wanna understand more, um, what it is like for different people to occupy different spaces, particularly Southern spaces. Fill out that matchbook request. Our staff loves being able to send you a curated list based on exactly what kind of reading you want to um, read or challenge yourself with. So please let us help with that. We also have some cool vibe lists, um, an anti, a couple anti-racism lists, just a lot, of, a lot of lists on there to, we hope, get you thinking in a way that might not be um, typical for you or typical for a typical reading curriculum. Um, we also are having an event on October 22nd with Claudio Sant, who wrote a book called Unworthy Republic. Uh, it just got on the finalist list for the National Book Award, but it's this amazing nonfiction book by a local author who's also a professor at EGA, um, all about indigenous peoples and the actual true story of their displacement and their history. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. I thought this audience in particular would be uh, compelled to attend that. Thank you, everybody. Um, does anybody on the panel have any last words or goodbyes or, or anything you'd like to say before we close out for the evening? Just thank you so much to um, the Bookshop and to Josina and Sadella Marini. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank you so much for Josin, to Josina, Avid Bookshop, and such a pleasure to meet Sunil and Tiana and everybody yeah. else who joined us. 
Thanks. Thanks. We'll gather with you all in person at some point. All right, Josina, we're ready. What's your last word? <laughs> well, just thank you to Hub City Press and to have it and to everyone. And also to everyone for showing up and for creating, like we created community just in this hour and just hope that everyone can go out and create welcome wherever you are because that's what we were made to do. So um, thank you for this. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you so much. Great night, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you again for sharing your time with us. Yeah.